All right, everyone. Today, we're stepping into the world of government credit risk. Now, when companies issue bonds, they're borrowing to grow and generate profits. Governments, on the other hand, issue debt to fund public services like education, infrastructure, and health care. And unlike companies, you can't just drag a government into bankruptcy court if they miss a payment. They've got something called sovereign immunity. In other words, if a government decides it won't pay, investors can't force it to sell assets to settle debts. So how do we evaluate their ability and willingness to pay? In this lesson, we're going to learn how to analyze both sovereign debt, debt issued by national governments, and non-sovereign debt issued by local or regional governments, government agencies, and even quasi-government entities. By the end, you'll understand the unique factors impacting government creditworthiness and the role public debt plays in broader economic stability. Let's dive in. Sovereign credit analysis. First up, why do governments borrow in the first place? Unlike a company, a government isn't in it for profit. It borrows to fund public services and balance its budget when revenues fall short. Government bonds are generally seen as lower risk because they're backed by the government's ability to collect taxes. But not all government bonds are equal. Developed countries like the U.S. and Germany tend to be safer bets, while emerging economies often come with higher risk, influenced by economic, political, and social factors. So what factors do we look at when analyzing sovereign credit risk? We've got two big categories here, qualitative and quantitative factors. Let's start with the qualitative side. The qualitative factors in sovereign credit analysis are all about the environment and behavior of the government. They're softer indicators, not numbers, but they're still essential. Government institutions and policy. How stable are the political institutions? Is there a strong rule of law, transparent financial reporting, and a commitment to repaying debt? In places where the legal system is shaky, debt enforcement can be difficult, leading to increased credit risk. Take Venezuela, where political instability and weak rule of law have led to default and eroded investor confidence. Compare that to Switzerland, known for its stable government and strong legal framework, making it a safer investment. Fiscal flexibility. This is about how well a government can adjust its spending and manage debt. A government with good fiscal flexibility can adapt when times get tough by cutting spending or enforcing tax collection. Monetary effectiveness. Here we look at the central bank's independence and its ability to manage inflation and promote stable growth. Central banks that aren't politically influenced, like the Federal Reserve in the U.S., typically instill more confidence. Economic flexibility. How big, diversified, and resilient is the economy? A diversified economy with various industries is less risky than one that depends on a single commodity or sector. Saudi Arabia has historically relied heavily on oil, which makes its economy vulnerable to oil price fluctuations. On the other hand, Germany's diverse economy, including automotive, pharmaceuticals, and machinery, offers more resilience. External status. Countries with strong international ties, reserve currency status, and stable trade policies are generally less risky. A reserve currency like the U.S. dollar makes it easier for a country to access foreign investment and service debt. All right, let's move on to the quantitative factors. These are more concrete, focusing on economic indicators and ratios that show a government's ability to handle its debt. Fiscal strength includes debt burden and affordability ratios. Debt burden ratios. The debt to GDP and debt to revenue ratios give us a sense of how big the debt is relative to the size of the economy and government income. Higher ratios mean a heavier debt load. 
Japan has one of the highest debt-to-GDP ratios, but it's still considered relatively safe because of its stable economy and strong institutional structures. Debt affordability ratios tell us how much of the government's revenue goes to interest payments. For example, the interest to GDP and interest to revenue ratios show how much of the economic output or revenue is being eaten up by debt costs. A higher ratio means less money for public services, which can strain the economy. Economic growth and stability. Indicators like GDP size, GDP per capita, and real GDP growth measure the economy's scale and consistency. Stable growth is a positive sign, while high volatility can mean increased risk. China has shown significant real GDP growth over recent years, signaling economic expansion. However, growth volatility can raise concerns about sustainability and increase credit risk. External stability. Here, we look at the country's foreign currency reserves and its ability to manage external debt. Key measures include FX reserves to GDP and reserve ratio, FX reserves to external debt, which tell us if the country has enough reserves to cover its debt obligations. Russia built up substantial foreign reserves before the sanctions, allowing it to manage external debt despite economic pressure. For countries with limited reserves like Argentina, fluctuations in currency reserves can lead to defaults during crises. Now let's talk about non-sovereign debt, which is issued by entities like local governments, agencies, and supranational institutions. These are distinct from national governments, but often benefit from some level of government backing. There are four main categories here. Agencies. These are quasi-governmental bodies created to provide public services like housing or student loans. They often have implicit support from the government, which makes them relatively low risk. In the U.S., the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac provide support for mortgage financing and enjoy a high credit rating due to government backing. Government sector banks and development financing institutions. These banks are set up by governments to support specific economic sectors. They generally carry credit ratings similar to the government. Supranational issuers. Organizations like the World Bank, established by multiple governments to fund economic development, fall into this category. Since these entities are supported by multiple member countries, they tend to have high credit worthiness. Regional government issuers include state or local governments that issue debt, typically in the form of general obligation bonds or revenue bonds. General obligation bonds are backed by the general revenues of a government, like property taxes or sales taxes. Analysis here is similar to sovereign debt, focusing on the issuer's economy, business climate, and budget discipline. Revenue bonds are riskier because they're only backed by the revenue from a specific project, like a toll road. Evaluating these bonds involves analyzing the project's revenue stream and whether it can cover debt payments. Consider a city issuing a revenue bond to fund a new toll bridge. If traffic volume doesn't hit projections, revenue will fall short, affecting the bond's credit worthiness. When we're evaluating non-sovereign government debt, there are some unique considerations. Taxing authority. Unlike national governments, non-sovereign issuers may have limited authority to raise taxes, impacting their ability to service debt. Jurisdictional limits. Regional governments don't control national fiscal and monetary policies, so they're more vulnerable to economic swings and federal policy changes. Project viability. 
For revenue bonds, it's crucial to assess the project's expected cash flow and debt service coverage ratio, DSCR. A DSCR above 1.0 indicates that project revenue should cover debt payments, which is a positive sign of credit worthiness. So that's the big picture on government credit analysis. Understanding how sovereign and non-sovereign entities differ helps us evaluate their credit risk more effectively. From a government's debt ratios to a regional issuer's project-specific cash flows, these factors guide us in assessing public debt's safety and potential returns. Remember, credit analysis for public debt isn't just about the numbers, it's about the context. Political stability, economic resilience, and the government's track record all matter. By combining qualitative insight with quantitative metrics, you'll gain a complete view of public debt risk and return. Keep these concepts in mind as you study, and remember to think through real-world examples. They're invaluable in deepening your understanding. Good luck, and let's keep up the momentum.